Get Rich Education is brought to you by Refoil and Gas Companies, partners in American energy production for world consumption. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Hey, welcome to GRE, Get Rich Education, show 19. I hope you've had an abundant week, expanding your knowledge, expanding your means, and making money follow you. I want you to experience some of these real estate investing epiphanies like I've had. When you close on that first out-of-market turnkey single-family home with a reputable provider and get that first monthly cash flow check, say it's $212, $212, that's a real ta-da. It's sort of magical. You just made money follow you. That's $2,500 a year, and it doesn't have a big impact on your life yet. But that's only your first property, and now, no matter where you go, that money will follow you, and you didn't work for it. Another ta-da is when you realize that the power of leverage is building a massive accumulated pool of wealth for you at the same time those monthly cash flow streams flow in. So, hey, you know something? It's kind of funny. I just looked over to make sure that a sign that I post on the door is still there. Before recording here, I tape a handmade sign onto the outside of the glass front door that says, please don't ring the doorbell, I'm recording. Well, in Anchorage during the wintertime, it's often below freezing. Sometimes the freezing weather makes it so that the tape won't stick and the sign falls down flat and face down onto the sidewalk. I want the sign to stay up. I don't want a UPS delivery person ringing the doorbell and screwing up the show. Um, In five years, maybe it will be the Amazon drone at the door instead and they'll contact me by text rather than by doorbell and I can just silence my phone. So... Well, hey, for some much warmer thoughts, Tom Hopkins International Sales Academy begins today in Orlando, Florida. Hopefully some of you episode 12 listeners acted on that offer and you're there today to learn how to be better sellers. My right-hand man here at Get Rich Education, John Collins, left and went to Orlando for today learning how to develop his sales skills with Tom Hopkins. Tom Hopkins really had me laughing on this show last month with his techniques to get those easy little yeses from prospective buyers when you're trying to sell. Isn't it, wasn't it, wouldn't it, couldn't it, shouldn't it, haven't you, have you? Just some great sales techniques from the master. So always be selling, but never be selling out. Hey, well, I've talked before about how you're only going to get as far as the power and skill of an adept team that you hire in business or in real estate investing. Superhero syndrome is that condition I've named of thinking that you're going to go it alone all the way to living your dreams and achieving financial freedom all by yourself. Going it alone in the beginning can be helpful to understand things from the inside, no doubt about it. But it's not sustainable over the long term if you want to ultimately get to where you're going. I mean, Michael Jordan had coaches like Dean Smith and Phil Jackson, and Jordan had Scottie Pippen. LeBron James and Kevin Durant, they have coaches. Kevin Durant has Russell Westbrook to dish him the rock. So flying solo is not a scalable proposition. How many rental units can you really handle on your own? Acquire, lease, manage, renovate, repair, cost itemize, maintain appropriate asset protection structures for, and do the taxes for, and even if you could, how many of those tasks would you want to do, and how many could you become so proficient at that it made sense to keep doing it yourself and not hire qualified help? I hire practically the best team members that I can find. I've consulted Rich Dad Advisor Tom Wheelwright's firm, ProVision Wealth, 
to do a tax strategy and asset protection strategy for me and my wife. And then I hired Rich Dad advisor Garrett Sutton's firm to implement the asset protection strategy for us. And I've retained both of those firms, Tom Wheelwrights to do our tax returns and Garrett's to maintain the corporate structures. Now, these professionals have fees, of course, that's what they're in business for. But hiring the best professionals, it doesn't cost me money. It makes me money. And that's potentially a way for you to think about it too. I expect that the fees that I pay them to be more than offset by the savings that they find me. And when I do this, it's like a risk-free return to me. Additionally, Garrett Sutton's firm and Tom Wheelwright's firm are used to working together. They communicate well and there are efficiencies there. If those savings aren't enough, what about the non-financial component? You know, the peace of mind that I have about being backed by the best in the event of a lawsuit or an IRS tax audit is something that I can't even put a price on. I mean, some choices are just easy. I had Rich Dad Advisor Garrett Sutton on the show for episode 15 four weeks ago, and my guest today is Rich Dad Advisor CPA Tom Wheelwright. Over the course of your lifetime, your greatest financial expense will be taxes. It was Benjamin Franklin that said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Well then, Benjamin Franklin, whom I respect immensely, he was brilliant, you know, I just want to ask, then how could one write a popular book called Tax-Free Wealth, Mr. Franklin, that legally shows you how to permanently reduce your taxes even down to zero? Tom Wheelwright has authored a book with just that title, Tax-Free Wealth. He's got one of those Rich Dad Advisor series of books with the purple covers that's always worth reading. It has a foreword written by Robert Kiyosaki. I own the book. In addition to being a prominent, well-known tax strategist, Tom Wheelwright is also a brilliant wealth strategist. Hey, well, speaking of books... I've got a deal going with Audible.com such that you Get Rich Education listeners can get a free audiobook and 30-day free trial if you go to audibletrial.com slash getricheducation. I'll put that in the show notes. My suggestion for your free audiobook choice is Tom Wheelwright's Tax-Free Wealth. The nice thing about that book is Tom narrated it himself, so you get Tom's voice with your free audiobook. Hey, well, before I start the Tom Wheelwright interview, to let you know what's coming on next Friday's show, it will be Vocab Rehab for episode 20. A lot like I did in episode 10, I'll teach you investor vocabulary. This is vital. The words that you use help define the network of people that you cultivate. Often your net work determines your net worth. You know, Some industry people throw around all these financial and investing terms like every listener knows what they mean, and it just gets some people left behind. So learn the language of investing. And then for episode 21, it will be about me and Anchorage, Alaska. You'll learn a little bit more about me and the city that my wife and I choose to spend more than nine months a year in, Anchorage, AK, and we call that home. I'll also tell you more about Anchorage, Alaska's economic drivers and what the real estate investment climate is like here, something I think that you'll find fascinating and I think that you'll be surprised with what I have to tell you there. And no, Anchorage fourplex buildings don't melt if it gets too warm, so you don't need to ask about that in this modern city of more than 300,000 people. And then after those two episodes, I plan to have some really terrific guests back on, so All right, as far as today's show, uh, here we go with Rich Dad Advisor, Tom Wheelwright. We've got a real treat with Rich Dad Advisor, CPA Tom Wheelwright on the show this week. Tom is the only tax advisor I've ever heard that's interesting and fun to listen to. Uh, That's right. I said taxes in conjunction with fun and interesting right there. (laughs) Tom Wheelwright is the creative force behind ProVision, the world's premier strategic CPA firm. I'm a ProVision client myself. His firm has done my wife and I's tax strategy, and they've prepared our taxes for three or four years now. 
Tom is a leading expert and published author on partnerships and corporation tax strategies. He's a well-known platform speaker and wealth education innovator. He often travels the country with Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Group. Tom is the author of the best-selling book, Tax-Free Wealth, which I've read, and that book has been at number one on Amazon in the corporate category. Tom's been helping uh, readers of that book and his clients reduce their taxes permanently, and Donald Trump selected Tom to contribute to his Wealth Builders program, and Donald called Tom the best of the best. Rich Dad Advisor Tom Wheelwright, welcome to Get Rich Education. Hey, thanks so much. It's great to be on the show, Keith. Tom, so really, when is the right time to engage a tax professional, and what's the best way for one to go about doing that? Well, that, that always begs the question, when, when do you want to start saving taxes? <laughs> so uh, literally, saving taxes is a daily activity. When, when you think about your life on a daily basis, every day there's money coming in and there's money going out. Well, that money coming in is either taxable or not. And that money going out is either deductible or not. So every, literally, taxes invade every part of our life. And so we have a choice every day. Do I pay more? Or do I pay less taxes? And that's why the sooner you start, the sooner you do your, your tax strategy, you know, the, the sooner you, you save taxes and pay less to Uncle Sam. Now, most listeners to this show are real estate investors, not all of them. It, and we know taxes are sort of a, a dynamic and a changing field. They, they don't stay static. They change sometimes year to year. So really, what are some of the latest developments that have happened in the tax world today? Real estate has a major development this year that everybody should be aware of. And I actually see very little of it in the press, which is a little astounding to me. And that is that last year... Um, actually, a couple of years ago, but last year is when it was first implemented. The, uh, the U.S. Treasury, which is the IRS, basically, a part of the IRS, and they released new regulations on how to treat uh, repairs to your properties, to real estate. And whether you're leasing real estate or whether you own real estate, these regulations apply to you. They are a major change. They require a couple of things. First of all, they require you to... For your 2014 tax return, you must file a change in accounting method. This is a 30-page form, and you may have to file more than one. You may have to file three or four of them. Your accountant has to understand these regulations. Not only that, but they're retroactive. So you actually have to go back. Let's say that you've owned an apartment building for the last seven years. You have to go back to day one and recalculate your repairs versus your what you've capitalized over the entire seven years, and you play catch up this year. You have to do that. This is a this is like a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. First of all, a lot of people are going to be better off. They're actually going to get a big deduction this year by following these regulations. Some people will actually have a, an additional tax they have to pay. If they have an additional tax, it gets spread over four years. But if they get a tax benefit, it's caught up this year. Well, here's the thing, though. Normally, you have to apply for a change in accounting method, which is a long, expensive process. This year, this year only, you get a freebie. It's automatic. So you must do this this year. This is the biggest change in real estate since Reagan changed the depreciation tables back in the 1980s. This is the, the, big, the biggest single change, and people are not talking about it in the real estate industry. Okay. I mean, that really doesn't sound that fun to me to go back through seven years of records to go ahead and determine this. But I mean, would this be more likely to be of a benefit to the taxpayer than, than it would be for, for some sort of loss? Or I think in a lot of cases, it's going to be a benefit to the taxpayer. I think a lot, a lot of taxpayers are going to find, uh, are going to end up with a big deduction this year. Some will not. I mean, the reality is some will not. But the point is, this isn't an option. You don't get to choose whether to apply the regulations to your business. You must apply them. And if you don't and they catch you, you're subject to penalties. So this is something that nobody likes it. Nobody likes the idea that they're going to spend money on this. We're working with a big developer in Texas right now uh, because they had not heard anything from their CPA about it. They got a bunch of uh, apartment buildings. We're going, to, we're going to go back to day one and we're going to review all that. I think it will produce, I personally think, based on how most people account for things, um, in real estate, I think for most people, it's a tax benefit to them and significant tax benefit. So it's not just something that's required. It's something that really you ought to be doing because you're missing out. 
Okay, yeah, I seem to remember getting the form from your firm already, I think, last year sometime. So, Tom, so when you see a new client at your firm that's an investor, and often that might be a real estate investor, what's sort of the low-hanging fruit? Like, what are some of the easier things you identify where they could have been permanently reducing their taxes, but they haven't been? For real estate investors, the first one, of course, is the cost segregation. I mean, that's absolutely easiest, quickest, fastest thing to do. Um, a cost segregation is simply when you buy a property, you have to recognize that you're buying four types of properties. You're buying the land, you're buying the building, you're buying the contents of the building, like the ceiling fans, the blinds, the all of the improvements inside the building, but you're also buying the improvements outside the building, landscaping, the fencing, the, the lighting, all of that kind of stuff. Well, each of these is depreciated differently. In other words, uh, depreciation is simply the deduction you get for wear and tear over a period of time. Land doesn't wear out, so there's no depreciation deduction for land. Buildings wear out fairly slowly. So a commercial building, the IRS, uh, the, the rule is they, they say, well, we're going to give you a deduction of about 2.5% a year, which is a th- basically a 39-year uh, depreciation table. And residential buildings, we're going to give you uh, about 3.6% a year, which is a 27 and a half year. Okay, most real estate investors, when we see them come in, that's what all their account did. They broke it down between land and building. Well, wait a minute. What about the contents of the building? Well, the contents of the building, those wear out in five to seven years. Land improvements, fencing, etc. those wear out, according to the IRS, in 15 years. So what that means is, is that instead of 2.5% or 3.6% depreciation rate, what we get is, you know, somewhere between a 10 10%, 5 to 10% on the uh, land improvements, and 20 to 30% a year on the contents of the building. Well, what percentage is actually contents land improvements? You'd be surprised. You, you, hire, you have to, by the way, under the IRS rules, you must hire a professional to do this. We don't even do this. We, hire, we actually su- uh, subcontract this out to people who are, this is all they do for a living, is cost segregations. But when you do it, You'll find sometimes that at somewhere between 40 and 60% frequently is really attributed to the contents and the land improvements. So you're talking about increasing depreciation by hundreds of thousands of dollars on a commercial building or an apartment building. And here's what's even better. You catch up all in one year. So let's say that you were, you were t- taking it at 2.5% a year for the last five years and you, and you go in and you do a cost segregation. Well, that means you've taken 12.5% when you might have supposed to have been taking 100%. Well, now the difference, that 87.5% is all deductible in the year you do the cost segregation. What's even better is a good cost segregation person, they'll give you an estimate of both. They'll give you a flat fee and then an estimate of the savings before they ever start work. So you have, I mean, there's there's no risk to this thing, you know, from the standpoint of I'm really going to see savings. They're going to they're gonna give that to you before they start work. So this is like, I mean, you may pay $10,000 for a cost segregation that saves you $100,000 this year in taxes. I mean, that is like the best return you're ever going to see. You're not going to see that, quite frankly. I don't see real estate investments that make that kind of money. But tax savings can make that kind of money. So that's, a, that's the biggest low-hanging fruit. The second low-hanging fruit we see is it's what kind of entity are you using? And I go through, by the way, both of these are in my book, Tax-Free Wealth. We talk about cost segregations in the chapter seven on depreciation. And we also talk about how you set up your entity. In other words, how do you own that real estate? I see a lot of mistakes with real estate investors. For example, I teach classes all the time, as you know, and I'll always have somebody, I'll go through the entities and I'll talk about why you never, ever own real estate, um, investment real estate in an S corporation. And I'll always say, I'll, I'll kind of look around and, and I'll see the person who goes, oh, and the next break, they're talking to me. I own, I own investment real estate in an S corporation. <laughs> All the time I see it, it's just a huge mistake because the tax consequences of that are nasty. Well, we, you know, we can work to fix it. I mean, there's some cost to fixing it, but... You know, how you set up, you know, whether you own it through an LLC tax as a partnership, as a sole proprietorship, you set it up as an S corporation, C corporation, how you set up your entities. I would say outside of the cost segregation, 50% of the tax savings 
that people are going to see when they do a tax strategy are going to be dependent on what types of entities they use and how the entities interact with each other. Then it's a matter of looking at all the other things. You know, how do I get more deductions? You know, simple deductions like people don't take home office deduction. How can you be a real estate investor and not take home office deduction? You know, well, my account said it's going to raise a red flag. Basically, what your account said was, I am scared to death of the IRS. I'm a tax professional, but I'm scared to death of the IRS. Why would you not take a deduction that's very clearly allowed within the law? Just because your account's afraid of it? That makes no sense at all. So, you know, there's a whole, I mean, there are literally, when you go through tax, you will see there's literally hundreds and hundreds of ways to, to reduce tax because the, fundamentally, and this is the whole premise of tax free wealth, the tax law, all it is is a series of tax benefits and incentives for business owners and investors. That's all it is. Um, it's an instruction guide, and you just need to follow the guide to reduce your taxes. Yeah, those sound like three great ways to save. With the second one that you mentioned, a cost segregation, and, and by the way, I've worked with your firm, and I've gone ahead and used your referral for a cost segregation on some of my larger buildings. A cost segregation is really a way to accelerate one's depreciation. Would you agree with that? It, it is, because what I know about real estate, real estate investors, because I've been, my specialty has been real estate for the past 30 odd years, is that the most important thing for a real estate investor is to have cash. And the sooner you have the cash, the more cash you have, the more real estate you can buy, right? So. Um, accelerating that deduction is critical. Now, one of the, the what, what people, you know, and I can always, I can already hear, you know, listeners saying, well, my CPA says yes, but then you have to recapture it when you sell it. My question back to that is why? With a 1031 exchange, you shouldn't have to, right? Exactly. Why, why aren't you doing a 1031 exchange? Why would you ever get out of real estate? Because there's so many different types of real estate. You can go from... Uh, a high growth real estate, like, you know, smaller, you know, projects to a, basically a bond, like buying a Walgreens. Okay. I mean, a, a Walgreens in a sell leaseback, that's basically like buying a corporate bond. Well, you can do that all tax free. Why wouldn't you? No doubt about it. So we're talking about accelerating one's depreciation through having a cost segregation done. Can we just uh, describe depreciation a little bit and why that's such a magical benefit to real estate investors? I think you called it the magic of depreciation in your book. I do. And, and the reason is because it's not, an ex- it's not a deduction that you have to spend money to get. Right. It's basically a gift from the government. So if think about it this way. Let's say you buy a million dollar building. Okay. And let's say, let's make it even better. Let's say that you put down $200,000 and let's say that bank puts down $800,000. Cool. All right. So you've got $200,000. They've got $800,000. We're going to do, get depreciation on the entire million dollars. Who gets the depreciation? You or the bank? You do. You, you get all of the benefit. They put up. of the money, you get 100% of the deduction. So what you're doing is you're expecting when you buy that real estate, that's you, Keith, when you buy a piece of real estate, you expect it to go down in value or up in value? Up. Of course. You're you're not going to buy that real estate if you think it's going to go down in value. And yet, you get a deduction as if it's going down in value. That's the magic of depreciation. Yeah, and I just love that you didn't have to spend any money to get it. Usually when you get a tax deduction, it's because you've incurred some sort of expense. And with depreciation, you haven't at all. That's exactly right. I've heard you describe that there are really three types of income, and each of those three different types of income get a different tax treatment. What are those types, and how can an investor use that to their advantage? Well, what we have is we have passive income, we have portfolio income, and we have ordinary income. Ordinary income is income that you earn in a business, wages, income from a retirement plan, like an IRA, 401k, a pension plan, private sharing plan. Those are all ordinary income. Those are taxed at what we call your normal income tax rates. Okay? All income is good. Now, don't get me wrong. I actually, I'll bet once a month, I hear uh, somebody say, well, my accountant said that the way I should pay less tax is to make less money. Yeah, that's so irresponsible. I, uh, to me, it's malpractice because I'm going, are you, are you, are you kidding me? That, that would imply that you're paying tax on more than 100% of your income. Even if your income tax rate is 70%, you're still getting 
30 cents for every dollar you earn, that's better than nothing. So it's ridiculous response. So you want to earn as much income as possible, even if it's ordinary income, even if it's high tax income, you still want the cash flow. Now, second type though is portfolio income. Portfolio income is like capital gains. Okay, capital gains and dividends, that's portfolio income. The great thing about capital gains, first of all, is capital gains and dividends, as most people know, are taxed at about half the rate of ordinary income, about half the rate. So that's a good thing. On top of that, you can only use capital losses to offset capital gains. Capital losses cannot offset any other kind of income. Well, a lot of people, even real estate investors, they've invested in the stock market or they've invested in, they've made a bad investment. Well, when a bad investment goes bad, it's a capital loss. That loss, you don't get to use, and you get 3,000 a year, but effectively, you don't get to use it until you have a capital gain. So anytime you can convert income from ordinary income to capital gain, you get two benefits. One is you get a lower tax rate, but the other is, is you get to offset up with any losses that you have from, you know, from a failed investment. So that, those are, that's portfolio income. The third kind is passive income. Passive income is like magic income because passive income effectively can be tax free. So uh, uh, the best example is what you guys do, Keith. It's in, in real estate investment. Investment real estate, as a general rule, is passive income, which means that, um, first of all, you've got depreciation to offset it. So you can have cash flow and not pay tax because you have depreciation. Now, let's say you have losses from a passive investment. Now again, passive losses can only offset passive income, which is why passive income is so important because a lot of things will generate passive loss. Real estate, unless you're a professional, real estate will generate passive loss, which can only be used again to offset income. If you have an investment in a business, um, let's say that you're just a passive owner, an uh, investor in a business, you're an angel investor, something like that. And, that, and they have losses the first few years, those losses are going to be passive, okay? They can only offset passive income. So passive income is absolutely always the best kind of income uh, because generating passive losses is not difficult and we can generate them through depreciation, which is not even, a, like you say, you don't even have to spend any money to get that, that benefit. And so we can just, we, we can effectively have tax-free income frequently with, with uh, passive income, it can be tax-free. Listeners, you can see why some people call Tom Wheelwright Tom Whirlwind. I just love it when he gets on a roll with this. <laughs> hey, Tom, well, I've read your book, Tax-Free Wealth, um, because a lot of times it speaks just sort of like uh, you speak, and it is kind of conversational. It doesn't read like it was written by a CPA. And, you know, I want to let my listeners know that they can get tax-free wealth, uh, you know, either in book form at Amazon, or they can buy it for free in an audio book form by going to audibletrial.com slash getricheducation. That's a new program I got going with Audible. So again, audibletrial.com slash getricheducation. And I definitely recommend checking out Tom Wheelwright's Tax-Free Wealth. You're listening to Get Rich Education with our guest, Rich Dad Advisor Tom Wheelwright. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Are you looking for an investment with the potential to offer monthly cash flow and tax advantages? While prices fall at the pump, now could be the time to invest in oil and gas. In business for nearly 30 years, Reef Oil and Gas Companies has endured price fluctuations and understands the importance of creating opportunities by purchasing oil and gas properties during distressed times. Primarily focused on the Bakken Three Forks of North Dakota and the Eagleford Channel of South Central Texas, Reef's model is designed to generate revenue and provide tax advantages from the production of oil and natural gas. For more information on this investment opportunity, go to reefogc.com. This is Rich Dad Advisor, Garrett Sutton. To grow your wealth, listen to the always valuable Get Rich Education. Welcome back to Get Rich Education with our guest, Rich Dad Advisor, Tom Wheelwright. Tom, I want to ask you how much a well-positioned real estate investor should be paying on their capital gains and their cash flow if they have the right tax advisor. How much should they be paying on each of those things? Zero. Zero on both. It, 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 it's an easy answer. If you are a serious real estate investor, in other words, you 
continually invest in real estate. When you take your cash flow, you put it back into real estate. When you sell a property, you buy another property. You should never, ever pay tax on your real estate, the gains from your real estate, or the cash flow from your real estate. Yeah, so I mean that effectively increases one's rate of return so they can go ahead and turn that money over and invest in more real estate and get five to one leverage with 20% down. Um, you know, I kind of like how you've put it that it's basically a risk-free return. Usually when an investor goes out and gets better returns, oftentimes they might be taking on more risk. But if you have the right tax advisor, you've kind of taken on a risk-free return effectively. Yeah, there's no question. It's risk-free and it's tax-free. I mean, you, you think about it, you don't get a deduction for uh, federal income taxes that you pay. So when you get the money back, it's not taxable. And, and it's risk-free because the reality is the absolute fastest, easiest way to put money in your pocket is to reduce your taxes. Um, it, you know, I, I look at this, and, and I, I was sitting down with a client yesterday, and he's got, you know, businesses and some investments. And he says, well, you know, I know this stuff's a mess. And I go, yeah, I've seen worse. I mean... This, you know, when you do it every day, when you have an advisor who really understands the law and works strategically all the time, in other words, they're working towards the future, not, not always worried about the past. They're always focused on, okay, what, what's my plan? When you do that, reducing your taxes truly can be risk-free. So what about some of the changes that are potentially coming? There's a lot more people that think marginal tax brackets and the tax rates associated with those are only going to increase in the future rather than go down. I mean, how can an investor best protect themselves by investing more in their 401k? Uh, yeah, certainly not that. <laughs> you know how I feel about 401ks. Uh, uh, my, my good buddy, Andy Tanner, also a retail advisor, wrote a book called 401 Chaos. And um, I, Robert Kiyosaki, he's asked me on stage all the time, he goes, so uh, how do you feel about 401ks from a tax standpoint? I'm going, from a tax standpoint, they're a horrible idea. Think about this. And the same is true for IRAs, by the way. Think about this. You get a tax deduction now when you have a lot of other deductions. So your tax bracket's probably lower today than it will be when you retire. When you retire, you're going to pay the taxes on that at a higher tax rate. Number two, you've got inflation. So inflation, by definition, you're going to be in a higher tax bracket. Number three, let's say I, I get people all the time say, well, what if I invest in real estate through my IRA? What a horrible idea. We just said that you should never, ever pay tax on your cash flow or your capital gains from real estate. In fact, the only way that you're going to pay tax is if you don't have good tax advice, and one of those is do it in, a, in an IRA. Because if you do real estate in an IRA, you will eventually pay tax. You'll never get any of the tax benefits that you would get from real estate if you were outside of an IRA. So uh, obviously, I mean, there are people that should, should put their money in 401k. There are people who want to bury their head in the sand. They don't want any information. Um, they don't want to learn uh, about investing, and, but they want to put some money away. Absolutely, do the 401k. All right. Or they're just, you know, they're, they're not going to go invest in real estate or in gas or anything else. They're just, they say, I just want my money in a well-diversified portfolio of mutual funds. In other words, their, their wealth strategy is buy, hold, and pray that their stock portfolio goes up. For those people, absolutely. Max out your 401k. You know, knock yourself out. But for serious investors, if you're investing in a 401k, stop. You know, get the education. Get what you need to know in order to invest in better investments that you that you would not do in a 401k, and let's let's get out and, and take charge of your own investing. Yeah, I'm with you. And most listeners to this show are interested in being that investor and not so much putting money in their 401k. I mean, my problem with the 401k transcends taxation. You know, my big question is, where's your income? Where's your income? While you're contributing to a 401k, it's not producing any positive cash flow for you. So it's true. Let's talk uh, real briefly. You asked the, the other question about, okay, what, what's coming down the road? Yeah. Um, really, the best way to do that is, is to just have a really good tax firm that's doing your, your, uh, giving you tax advice and preparing your tax returns. Because what we do, for example, I, I watch, as you know, I, uh, we're watching the legislation all the time. And what I know, see, I spent three years in the national office of Ernst & Young. And I was there when the last big tax act, 1986. And what I learned while I was there is that there's a list 
of changes to the tax law that is maintained by the Treasury Department and the uh, staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation, who does the, uh, actually, they, they do the law changes. They are always adding to that list, take off that list, and things move up the list. When you saw um, some of Obama's tax proposals in his State of the Union address, which I know very few people watched, but <laughs> I did because I was looking for the tax side of it, those proposals are not new proposals. Okay, these are things that have been in the hopper for several years. So if you have somebody who's watching, you can see what's, what's likely to happen and you can plan for it. Uh, if, if you get caught off guard, you're just stuck. So it, it, it's really a matter of having the financial education and, and really working with an advisor who, who pays attention to what's going on. Yeah, I've been a big proponent of telling my listeners, you know, you are about the power of your, your team. And I've been pretty pleased ever since I made ProVision part of my team three or four years ago. So you have one of the few firms that I've ever run into that knows how to go ahead and optimize the tax treatment that Reef gives an investor. So, I mean, using cash, what is the difference in tax treatment between an investor investing $10,000 in Reef and an investor investing $10,000 in Exxon stock? How's that look? $10,000 in Exxon, you get no tax benefit. Yeah. The, the best you're going to get is when you sell the stock, if it, if it goes up in value, you're going to get a reduction in your rate because it's going to be a capital gain. Okay, that's the best you're going to hope for. If you invest $10,000 in Reef or any other oil and gas driller, what you're going to get is the very first year, you're going to get a minimum of four to $5,000 deduction and maybe as much as $8,000 out of that $10,000 deducted. So it's an investment, but it's the only investment that is a deductible investment. Oil and gas is the only investment that's a deductible investment. And it's not all deductible the first year. I know Reef, for example, they drill over a number of years. But now's the time they're going out. uh, You know, now's the time for me. Now's the time I'd be investing in oil and gas because you don't invest in real estate when the prices are high. You invest in real estate when prices are low. Same with oil and gas. You invest in oil and gas when prices of equipment, prices of drilling, et cetera, are low. Prices of oil leases are low. So that when they go back up, you drill it, you pull it out at the higher price. So there, there's huge tax benefits. We, um, I, I kind of grew up in the oil and gas industry professionally. Um, oil and gas and real estate were my two specialties. And went to school at the University of Texas, so uh, it's kind of in my blood. And uh, that's why we do. We, we, we do a lot of oil and gas. I am, I, in, in uh, full disclosure, I am an investor in Reef. And uh, Reef is also a client uh, of ours, so uh, I am a little little prejudiced. Um, but uh, uh, you know what, oil and gas. Uh, I mean, remember, just like any any investment, you must do your due diligence of every project. You got to look at their, you know, what what you're going to get out of it. So um, don't don't take my word for it, but understand that there are some significant tax benefits, both on the front end, also on the back end. Only 85 cents of every dollar that you get back is taxable in oil and gas. So you get a 15% depletion. It's not like real estate where, you know, you you basically, that depreciation is recaptured. Depletion is never recaptured. Depletion is a permanent, it's not a deferral, it's a permanent tax benefit. Okay, we're talking about tax benefits specific to direct investment in oil and gas wells like with Reef rather than Shell or Exxon stock. So how does it actually look for the investor? If they invest $10,000 in Reef, you talk about some back-end tax benefit, but on the front end, with that $10,000, if they can deduct up to 80% of it, which would be $8,000, and they're in a 40% tax bracket, would that be right that that reef investor would get a $3,200, basically a, a credit in that same year? That's right. I mean, that's like, that's like the government. Think of it this way. The government is sharing your risk. You put in 68 cents, they put in 32 cents for every dollar you put in. You put in 6,800, they put in 3,200. The government's sharing the investment, but you're getting all the return. So in that example, that's like getting a de facto 32% rate of return on your money in Reef. And what would your return be with Exxon stock? Immediately, nothing. I mean, literally, you get that benefit immediately. That's a 32% immediate return. That's remarkable. So does direct oil and gas investing in something like Reef, I mean, does that give an investor even more tax benefits than income real estate or, or less? Or does it depend? Or They're, they're different. That it's not more or less. It's more on the front end. It's it's less over time, and the reason is is that 
oil and gas is not a leveraged investment. So where with with real estate, if you put in ten thousand, the bank's going to put in forty, and so basically you're going to get a tax benefit on fifty thousand dollars. And oil and gas, you put in ten, you're going to get a tax benefit on ten. So over time, real estate is actually a better tax wise. There's one other thing though. Uh, we talked about passive income, passive loss. Uh, so real estate, unless you're a professional real estate investor, your losses are passive losses, which means they can only offset passive income. Not so with oil and gas. Oil and gas is the only only loss, the only investment where you don't have to be active in any way, shape, or form, and you still get the tax benefit. So you can take that eight thousand dollars deduction that you get out of that ten thousand, and you can offset that against your wages. You can offset that against your business income. You can't do that with real estate unless you're a real estate professional. So in, in that case, REIF might just might be the more tax-advantaged investment over real estate if one is a, an employee at a W-2 job. No, in fact, it, it, clearly, clearly it is. Hey, that's been great. Well, hey, Tom, as we're about to wrap up here, is there anything else that uh, I should have asked you but didn't? Oh, uh, you know, uh, Keith, I, I, I can go on forever. My, uh, my, my, my stated uh, mission in life is to make taxes fun, easy, and understandable. And th- this is the re- reason I wrote the book, and I appreciate your comments on tax-free wealth because it really was meant to be a conversation. It, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of fun to write. It, 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 I actually wrote it in a month. I'd been thinking about it for so long. I just, I just put all my thoughts down. I just wrote as if I were, you know, telling a conversation. That's why I wrote. I wanted. I, I think taxes. The fundamentals of taxes are really easy and understandable. You understand that the tax law is a series of incentives, and that all you have to do is follow the follow the law and follow the incentives. You're going to lower your taxes. You're going to be happier. The reason they're fun, of course, is because you write out the word refund. Funds right in the middle of it. <laughs> all right. Well, I think you've made it fun, easy, and understandable again. So thanks so much for stopping by, Tom. Thank you. To get a hold of Tom's firm, ProVision Wealth, for a top-notch tax strategy, asset protection strategy, or a business strategy, go to ProVisionWealth.com, or you can give them a phone call at 1-866-467-5809. I'll put that in the show notes. ProVision Wealth has free consultations. Tom's a great part of my team for reducing taxes and creating wealth, so I'm glad to share that with you. Until next week, don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to the Get Rich Education Podcast, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively.